free goodies. Uh, I don't know. Taco Bell's still giving stuff away. I don't think anybody's that interested, but... All right. Well, <clears throat> welcome. Um, I have not yet graded all the exams. I have graded some of the exams. So I think some of you, maybe if you go into Blackboard, you already can see um, your score and the feedback. I'll do those one at a time, and then uh, we'll go over the solution for the exam in Monday's class. So um, today we are going to talk about the momentum depth relationship, and uh, the application for that is hydraulic jumps. Before we start with that, let's just uh, look at these announcements. Your next homework assignment is due on Wednesday, and uh, that is available now on Blackboard. Um, have to uh, also mention that your final project report is due on Monday the 10th. And so um, that final project report is where you give the updated demand estimates based on the feedback I gave you the first time around. You give your updated network design, including the pipe sizing and the elevation of the reservoir. You make any required changes to the, um, to the reservoir sizing. And then you also do the economic analysis, coming up with a cost estimate for your overall network. And the cost depends on the pipe sizes and the volume of the reservoir required. And then uh, you kind of polish it up, make it read well, and submit your report by Monday, the 20th of April. I'm not sure if I get that comment, Farah, due today. Today's the 10th. The project's due on the uh, 20th. All right, so uh, Jeff's comment. Oh, OK, thank you. Uh, Yes, Jeffrey, it's not due the 10th. It's due the 20th. The project is due on Monday the 20th. All right. So today we're going to um, talk about momentum depth relationship. And the reason for this is um, in open channel flow, what we've been trying to do is come up with some methods for um, predicting what the flow depth will be. You know, for a certain flow rate, and knowing the channel geometry, like the width of the channel, its roughness, um, maybe the shape of the channel, if it's rectangular, trapezoidal, something else. Um, Manning's equation is what we used when conditions were steady and uniform. Uh, steady meaning that the flow rate is constant over time. Uniform meaning that the, uh, um, the conditions aren't changing in the direction of flow. But it's rarely going to be the case that you have steady uniform flow for any length of time or any you know, length of channel. And so more often, we're going to have situations where conditions are non-uniform. And if you have a channel step up or a drop down in the channel, uh, then you use specific ener energy analysis. So that was part of what you did in uh, your exam, where you were looking at the case of a step up. And uh, you also use specific energy analysis to find out what's the new flow depth when you have a channel expansion or contraction. So those are all tools that you can use to predict what will be the depth of flow in an open channel scenario. What we're going to talk about now is what happens when we have a transition between supercritical flow conditions and subcritical flow conditions. Now this is a very special case where um, you've done some calculations to classify the flow regime. You know, for example, if you calculate the Froud number at a location and the Froud number is above one, then you know that means you have supercritical flow. But there's something special that happens when supercritical flow encounters subcritical flow. And that, that special thing is called a hydraulic jump. And the uh, hydraulic jump depth can be predicted with the momentum depth function. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now you probably have uh, in the back of your mind some memory of when we used the momentum function in closed conduit flow last semester in fluid mechanics. Here's just one of the flow cases that we looked at with a nozzle. There was also veins and um, junctions. 
So uh, in the case of this nozzle, what we did was we said that the sum of the forces required to hold the system steady uh, plus any external forces that are applied can be equal to the momentum flow out minus the momentum flow in. So this was where you've seen momentum in closed conduit flow, but we can also discuss the momentum relationship in open channel flow. So when water is flowing downstream, and this diagram is just showing us that we have water that's uh, going downstream and the flow depth is changing, and so these conditions are not um, uniform because the flow depth is getting greater. We can do an analysis of the momentum using this expression, this momentum function that's on the screen right now. And that momentum function has two components. It has a kinetic component and a static component. And what it's related to is the motion of the water and the depth of the water. And each one of those things is going to contribute to how much momentum is in the water. And um, if we multiply this momentum function, both sides of it, an upstream and a downstream location by gamma, then what we would get is that the sum of the forces at two locations are equal to each other. And the reason why we do this uh, is that through a hydraulic jump that's caused when supercritical flow encounters subcritical flow, energy is not conserved. We can't do a specific energy analysis to predict what's going to happen in a hydraulic jump because energy is not conserved. So there is something that is conserved though and what's conserved through a hydraulic jump is momentum. And so this equation is what we're going to use to predict what will be the new depth downstream when you have a hydraulic jump. So if we just quickly jump back to that list of tools that we had. We had Manning's equation to predict the flow. We had specific energy analysis. We did specific energy analysis on the basis that the upstream and the downstream depth were related by specific energy being conserved. But specific energy is not conserved when there's a hydraulic jump. So we need this new equation, the momentum function. So momentum is conserved through a hydraulic jump. And the two components of the momentum function are the dynamic force uh, component and the hydrostatic force. And so the dynamic has to do with the amount of flow and its motion. The hydrostatic force is the depth of flow and H bar is the depth to the centroid. And we've talked about that in fluid mechanics. It's not the water depth, but in most cases if you have a rectangular channel, then the depth to the centroid is half of the flow depth. So um, we'll look at centroid relationships in in specific as we apply this momentum relationship. But let's talk about the need for it. So what we're looking at right now is a diagram of a steep slope. Water is flowing down a steep slope. And so this slope upstream of the transition. So this dashed line is a transition in slope. So before the transition, the slope was so steep that it's causing supercritical flow. And so the slope is greater than the critical slope. S sub C means the slope that causes critical flow. And so if you'll notice this dashed line represents the depth that's associated with the critical depth. So assuming a rectangular channel, remember you can find the critical depth with having the flow per unit width squared divided by G to the one third power and then you diagnose the flow regime. If the flow depth is less than the critical depth, that means supercritical conditions. We could also calculate the Froude number at one and we'd get a Froude number greater than one upstream. So we have supercritical flow and then the slope transitions. It's not as steep as it was before. So downstream, this slope is less than the critical slope. So what that means is that our flow depth which you can calculate with Manning's equation once it gets back into its normal equilibrium, uh, uniform flow, and this can be steady state. Your new downstream depth is going to be calculated with Manning's equation, and it's greater than the critical depth. So subcritical conditions, supercritical conditions. So anytime supercritical flow encounters subcritical flow, it goes through a hydraulic jump.
And so here this abbreviation, abbreviation stands for hydraulic jump. And that shaded area is meant to kind of bring to mind the uh, roiling and the turbulence that we see in a hydraulic jump that I'll demonstrate in a video and a couple of pictures today. But the idea here is that uh, rapidly varying flow, the variation in flow depth uh, can occur rapidly in the course of supercritical flow encountering subcritical flow. So um, diagram A is just showing it can be a difference in slopes that forces a hydraulic jump. That's one thing that can cause it. Another thing that can cause a hydraulic jump is an underflow gate. So water is flowing downstream and it encounters this underflow gate. So the water has to flow under the gate and because this gate was forcing the depth of flow below the critical depth. So if you look at the dash line again represents the critical depth. The gate is so low that the water that comes out is going super critical because the flow depth is below this critical depth line and then it can't support supercritical flow for long because the slope of the channel is less than the critical slope. So it's going to have to eventually transition back to its normal depth. The original normal depth, which has to do with the roughness, the width of the channel, the flow rate, all of those things, we can calculate the normal depth. And this temporary uh, supercritical flow has to go through the hydraulic jump to, ju to jump back up to its uh, normal flow depth. It, it can't just keep gradually changing to get there. This, we have a gradual change. It's gradually getting a little deeper, a little deeper, and it can't keep gradually changing. It has to go through a hydraulic jump. In the third case, we have a steep slope. So if you look down here, it says that the slope is greater than the critical slope. So this is steep, which means when you have an underflow gate, it goes from supercritical and it just gradually transitions back to its normal depth. And so the hydraulic jump isn't downstream of this underflow gate. It's upstream of the underflow gate because the underflow gate causes the water level to rise so that there's enough energy to force the water under this gate at a fast velocity. In other words, we, the underflow gate that's being lowered into the flow, it chokes the flow temporarily. And because it's choking the flow, the water is pooling upstream. The water depth is getting greater and greater and greater until it's deep enough that there's some pressure to push the water under the gate at a high enough velocity that it will um, that in and out, if we're considering this from the Reynolds transport theorem perspective, that in and out under this gate are equal. It gets back into that equilibrium, but upstream of the gate, we have this condition where the flow depth was forced above the critical depth, and so a hydraulic jump occurs. And so that's another instance of some physical feature that can cause a hydraulic jump. And then the last one we'll look at just now is one that I mentioned in our previous class when we were looking at um, flow down a spillway. And so this represents a dam. This represents a dam. And so, you know, there's water that's going down the spillway of a dam. And because it's uh, gaining so much velocity and increasing kinetic energy as it goes down the dam, it still has a lot of velocity, but our slope can't support supercritical flow because the slope is less than the slope that naturally would cause supercritical flow. So uh, since the slope is less than the critical slope, it has to go through this transition from supercritical to subcritical through a hydraulic jump. Okay, so those are some, some physical reasons why hydraulic jumps occur, and those are all illustrations of rapidly varying flow, but on the screen I also pointed out a couple of places where the flow was gradually varying. For instance, when I mentioned that the flow depth was gradually going up before it went through the rapid transition. And here you have a gradual transition from the supercritical depth back to its normal depth, which is still supercritical flow. Um, another gradual transition would be this 
water just on the upstream face of the obstruction. So water encounters a dam. The water depth is gradually decreasing until it finds some point upstream where the flow depth is normal. So later on, after we're done with hydraulic jumps, we're going to look at the tools for classifying gradually varying flow. And gradually varying flow is really tricky. It's uh, numerically intensive. So um, This momentum depth diagram is not a specific energy diagram, but it kind of looks like one. You remember when we were graphing on the vertical axis was the flow depth, and on the horizontal axis was the specific energy? It had this sideways parabolic shape that looks in some way similar, similar to what you've got here. But I'm going to, we'll go through an example today where we will calculate both a momentum depth diagram and a specific energy diagram. So that's the first thing I want to point out is, this is not a specific energy diagram. What we have on the screen here is a graph of the depth. And for a certain flow rate, um, there's a variety of different points of momentum that can occur. And so what we're doing is, for a certain flow rate, different combinations of depth and velocity that would recur for that same flow rate through a same channel. So the purpose of the momentum depth diagram is to predict what will be the new depth after the hydraulic jump. Because if I go back to this previous slide, we had all these pictures of things that can cause a hydraulic jump. But what we want to know is, what is the new depth? If we know the depth before the hydraulic jump was 1 meter, just to pick a number, after the hydraulic jump, what is it going to jump up to if the before depth is known, what's the after depth? So if you know that you've got some normal depth upstream and it's going to have to go through a hydraulic jump because of this downstream flow conditions, what will be the new depth? And so this formula that I'm going to show you later and the graphical method that has to do with the momentum depth diagram, the purpose of this diagram is to predict what will be the new flow depth. And the way that you find the new flow depth is you find out how much momentum did you have when conditions were super critical? So your flow depth before the hydraulic jump is y1. And your depth is less than the critical depth. That is the super critical momentum uh, depth. And for the same amount of momentum, because we say that momentum is conserved through the hydraulic jump, there is this other crossover point with the momentum depth diagram curve that corresponds to the y2. So it's going to be the conjugate depth. Sometimes conjugate depths are also called sequent depths. And so it's the same amount of momentum for the same flow rate, but um, it's just the subcritical root. You can think of like how when we were doing the specific energy diagrams, there was uh, you know, a cubic equation that you'd find three roots. One was negative, one was a supercritical root, and one was a subcritical root. Well, using that past experience as kind of an analogy for what we're doing here, we have, for the same amount of momentum, both a supercritical and a subcritical depth. All right. Um, hmm. Did I send you an Excel file? I meant to. I hope I did. Did you guys? All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Good. I'm glad. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that Excel file to work through this example. Um, we have a channel that is 6.5 meters wide. It's a rectangular channel that we're going to send 15 cubic meters per second through. And um, it can be a variety of different depths depending on how steep the slope is. So that's what would um, cause there to be a variety of different depths. But we're going to graph for this situation. We're going to graph both the uh, momentum expression and also specific energy, just to compare and contrast how they're similar and how they're slightly different. All right, so with that uh, template file that I sent you as the starting point, 
let's look at what we've got here. So we have our equation for specific energy. We have an equation for the momentum. And then across the top here, oh, you can't even, oh, wait, no, maybe you can. All right, across the top, we've got um, the flow rate is the same, regardless of what flow depth we want there to be. The width doesn't change, but there's a lot of different depths depending on how steep we make the channel. And so, for instance, um, if we make the channel really steep, then we know there would be a low flow depth, or we could make the channel really shallow, and it would be a deeper flow depth. All right, so if this is a rectangular channel, remember that the, uh, de the depth to the centroid is just half of the flow depth. So h bar is one of the terms that we're going to use in the momentum equation. And so h bar for a rectangular channel like this, the center of area is just halfway down. If it's trapezoidal, that's not the same. You'd have to use a different equation to find the center of area for a trapezoidal channel. But for a rectangular one, if you're following along with the uh, template that I sent you, it's just the depth divided by 2. So that's h bar and we can drag that down through the entire range of depths that we're looking at. Now if I asked you to do the same thing, you wouldn't necessarily know what depth to start with and what depth to end with. That would be kind of an iterative thing that you would figure out by looking at the results you get. So you may have to play around with different starting and ending depths and you maybe wouldn't know, oh, I, I'm really interested in 0.816. Well, where did that 0.816 come from, by the way? Let's calculate what's the critical depth. Because in the case of both a specific energy diagram and a momentum depth diagram, y sub c is a minimum point. So you definitely want to have some data both above and below the critical depth. And so this is the momentum depth diagram. If I went back to a specific energy diagram illustration, here's one. Here's some specific energy. And remember, the critical depth corresponded to the minimum specific energy as well. So for any flow condition that's described in problems like this, you should calculate what is the critical depth. And before we go any further, let's do that. So here, the critical depth is going to be the flow per unit area. So that's 15 cubic meters per second divided by the width of the channel. And the channel width is 6.5. So that gives me lowercase q. And I need to square that and then divide it by g, 9.81. And then all of that needs to be taken to the one-third power. So I have to put in an extra set of parentheses and take it to the power of 0 0.3333333. 3333. All right. So 0.816 is the critical depth. And uh, that's why I had included that here is, you know, when we uh, calculate the momentum depth diagram, I want to make sure that we have some data above it and some data below it for the figure that we're going to make. All right. So here's again the formula for how the critical depth is calculated. So it's the flow rate divided by the channel width to the power of 2 divided by g and then to the power of 1 third. All right. Now, the uh, cross-sectional area so what's the area of a rectangular channel? It's the width of 6.5 meters divided, uh, multiplied by the flow depth, y. Okay, so area is width times flow depth. And we can drag that down for all of them. All you need to do really is just double click on the edge, uh, that extra green uh, box right at the edge. Double click on that and it goes down through. 
velocity. Okay, so Q equals VA, therefore V is Q divided by area. So flow rate divided by area. Now how can we remember that? Well, it's burned into your memory, but you can always just look at the units. If you want meters per second, the way you get meters per second is you divide cubic meters per second by meter squared, and then that'll give you the velocity. Double click to pass it through the rest of the range. Okay. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we're going to calculate the specific energy and the momentum for this variety of different flow depths. So we're saying, um, you know, the water, depending on the slope, could be moving supercritical, it could be moving subcritical, and we want this both specific energy diagram in case we are going to be doing a uh, expansion contraction type problem or if we we're going to be doing a step up step down type problem then we'd use the specific energy diagram or if we are doing a hydraulic jump because of a transition in two different slopes then we'd use the momentum depth diagram so we'll start off by substituting this equation into the E column. So it is going to be the flow depth, Y, plus the velocity head. So V squared divided by 2G. So V squared divided by 2G, 2 times 9.81. Okay. So we've got the specific energy, and what we should see if, if this is right, if, I, if we don't, didn't somehow mess things up, the lowest specific energy should correspond to the critical depth. So let me now distribute that same formula down through all the rest of the flow depths that we have. And indeed, we see the lowest specific energy corresponding to the critical depth because that's the most efficient flow and that's why when there's pooling because of a choke the water only pools until it can flow at the critical depth over the obstruction because it's most efficient the water's lazy all right so we have the uh, specific energy and now let's do the same thing with the momentum function okay we have to have Q squared, a Q squared divided by G, 9.81 times the area. Okay. Now, plus the area times the depth to the centroid. So, area. times the depth to the centroid, h bar. Okay, And again, our momentum function should be minimized at the critical depth. So when I distribute that down through, I have the lowest momentum at the critical depth. Okay, so now let's make our, oh, it, that graph's already made was already set up for the right columns. So uh, let me zoom out a bit. So the specific energy diagram so let's double check the data that was selected there. All right so the uh, input for the horizontal axis was the energy. Okay, that checks out. And the input for the vertical axis is the depth. All right, so far so good. So that is the, uh, here is the specific energy diagram. And then the momentum depth diagram. You'll notice that I didn't select all of it. Let's see why. 
if I do the entire range, then it's just going to zoom out too far. I think I wanted to only look at, see how now we've got tons of extra graph up above the critical point. Sometimes you've got to just uh, zoom in on what you're interested to see. And I'm interested in what's just in the immediate vicinity above and below the critical depth. And so if I kind of clamp it down a little bit to here, now the graph is zooming in more on this uh, part of the, the range. So how do we use this graph? I mean, we just made it. What's it for? What's the point? Well, if you had a hydraulic jump and you knew that before the hydraulic jump, the depth was one thing, and you'd go up through that curve, and you'd find out for the same momentum function, what is the equivalent subcritical depth downstream. So a specific energy diagram is used for expansions, contractions, step up, step down. But the momentum depth diagram is used when you have supercritical flow encountering subcritical flow because of any of the features that we talked about before. Any questions on this spreadsheet specifically before we move on from generating your own momentum depth diagram? Um, Okay, I see oh, Jonathan had a question earlier, but he's got it now. Jeffrey, do you have a question? I just sometimes don't hear the, the notifier for the text chat. So if you have a question, Jeffrey was answering his question. Oh, why divided by two? Yeah, that's good. At least one of us did. Brandy gets the YC. Can't all right. Let's when in doubt throw it out. Let's start from scratch and get that Y sub C value. So I'm going to delete what I've got. All right. So equals the flow rate. So we need so it's lowercase Q is big Q divided by the flow width. So now that's what gives us lowercase Q is big Q divided by the width of the channel. Square that, divide by G, 9.81. And then we're going to need another set of parentheses because we want to take all of this quantity to the power of 1 third. So let me leave that on the screen for a moment just to make sure you've got the same thing. And then when I press Enter, it calculates the critical depth. All right, good. Great. Let's look at a couple of videos of what a hydraulic jump looks like. One on a small scale and one on a much larger scale. Uh, you could go into your kitchen and make a hydraulic jump. I know that's really exciting and let me prove to you how you can do it so that you can later tonight wow your friends and family with a hydraulic jump. Here we go. All right. So you see water's coming through a sink. And right now, the flow rate, you know, the tap's mostly closed. But they're going to open up the flow. And they're going to increase the flow by turning the handle. All right. So right now, what we're looking at is in the center, the flow conditions are super critical. And then as the water flows radially outward, the velocity is decreasing. And now think about the slope of a plate. The plate's horizontal. So it can't support supercritical flow on a horizontal plate. The, steep, the, the slope isn't steep enough. And so the flow has to transition from supercritical to subcritical. And this ring of turbulence around the outside that you can see, 
that is the hydraulic jump. So the flow rate increases, that pushes the hydraulic jump further outward. Oh, we gotta touch the hydraulic jump. Yeah. You are gonna be the hit tonight at dinner. All right, it's all supercritical. Decrease the flow rate, the hydraulic jump moves closer to the point of origin. So that's a fun little illustration. On a grander scale, here's a hydraulic jump as the water flows out of a gate. So you can see the turbulence, and this is why we can't use an energy relationship is there's so much energy being lost here. Uh, the turbulence and the roiling, uh, energy is not conserved in a hydraulic jump. In fact, quite to the opposite, um, energy is lost pretty dramatically. And that's part of the reason why sometimes hydraulic jumps are intentionally used as a tool. Um, downstream of a dam, you could try and force the hydraulic jump to occur in a certain location where you have armored the channel, like you put in a concrete lining, and you try and have the hydraulic jump happen where you want it so that the hydraulic jump doesn't occur someplace else and so that there's not so much velocity in the flow that it causes a scour in the stream. So here, if they're dumping water out of a dam into a river, they want the hydraulic jump to occur where these big concrete slabs are reinforcing on the side and at the bottom. And you don't want a big high velocity stream to go into an earth lined channel because it would just carry all the rocks and sediment away and it would cause uh, environmental problems if you have too much sediment in the stream then that interferes with the ability of fish to spawn and to uh, get the oxygen that they need. So that's another hydraulic jump. Much bigger than washing your dishes. Okay. So the important equation that you use to predict the new downstream depth is the momentum function. And we've just gone through an illustration of how you could graphically solve for the new downstream depth. The type of problem that you're going to see for hydraulic jump problems is I'm going to tell you how wide the channel is. I'm going to tell you the flow rate that's going through the channel. And I'll tell you the upstream depth. And so what I'll want to know is for a certain upstream depth, what does the hydraulic jump depth come to downstream? So solve for Y2 with all this other given information. And so you'll want to sometimes double check that the conditions upstream are supercritical. And so here's the Froude number equation that's always valid regardless of whether the channel is rectangular or trapezoidal. Here the big B means the top width of the channel. Lowercase b is used to indicate the bottom width of the channel. So if it's a trapezoidal channel, then you'd use the top width of the channel up there in the numerator. Um, if you have a rectangular channel, the Froude number is a little bit easier to calculate. So you can use this expression for the Froude number, either of them. So there's the graphical approach, which uses the momentum function, or, well, not or, I don't want to tell you the or yet. Just to illustrate how you do the graphical uh, approach, let's say, for example, that we had 10 cubic meters per second going through a channel that is uh, 3 meters wide, and this is trapezoidal. So the t equals 1. That means that the side slope of the channel is a 1 to 1 side slope, one vertical for one horizontal. So this is a little bit more complicated geometry than the table that we set up before, but the columns are the same. You'd have a variety of different depths. What's the cross-sectional area of this trapezoidal channel for that depth? What's the depth to the centroid? And then along the way, we're trying to calculate the momentum function. And so if your initial before the hydraulic jump depth was 0.6 meters, then we go and find the conjugate depth. So the amount, uh, same amount of momentum, what is the other depth from that? So if our initial depth was 0.6, so here's the 0.6. We find out how much momentum is there. It looks like 5.33 is the momentum function. 
And so we'd want to find out where else is the depth 5.33. Well, we don't know exactly. It's going to be somewhere between this 4.75 and the 6.01. So we'd either have to do like a linear interpolation or maybe even better yet, if you had to set up a spreadsheet, you could just go over here and set up a goal seek. And your goal seek would be change the depth until the momentum function is equal to 5.332. And so then that would be the same, amount, same amount of momentum and you'd be solving for the new depth. And it looks like if we take this graphically, what, 1.4? About 1.4 meters would be the depth downstream of the hydraulic jump. Yeah, it's such a bummer that we don't get to go play with the flume in the fluids lab. Let's see the hydraulic jump. I should have showed it to you last semester. I was saving the best for last, but then we ran out of time. Here's the equation that you can use. If you don't use the graphical technique, the Bellinger momentum equation can solve for the downstream depth directly. So it is based on the Froud number. And so if you want to find the depth downstream, you can put in the depth upstream. And then uh, you'd have to know the Froud number upstream. And these two equations are equivalent. Uh, sometimes you may already know the critical depth and it would be convenient to use this second form of the equation, but I'll point out that you're taking this expression to the third power, whereas if you're using the Froude number, you just square the Froude number. So these two equations are equivalent. And um, the assumptions of this Bellinger momentum equation uh, it assumes that um, a uniform velocity distribution, and this is probably, I've put the worst at the top in terms of assumptions. It's assuming that the velocity of the water in the channel is the same at the top of the river as it is at the bottom of the river. That's a pretty weak assumption, but it just makes the math so much easier that we just can't resist. So it's assuming, if we look at this, this illustration, it's assuming that at the bottom of the channel, the flow velocity is the same as at the top. Now we know that that's not true because of the no slip condition, the velocity at the bottom of the channel is zero and it gradually increases up to the maximum velocity which is just shy of the top. And so, um, you know, keep in mind that this Bellinger momentum equation is pretty good at predicting what the downstream hydraulic to jump depth will be, but one of the reasons why it's not perfect is because it assumes a uniform velocity distribution, but that assumption isn't true. And the faster moving the water is, the, the worse trouble we're in, in terms of that velocity distribution being departing from uniform. It assumes hydrostatic pressure distribution, which is fine. I mean, even though the water is moving horizontally, if you go down through the water, the pressure does increase. Um, it's just that the pressure isn't only described by hydrostatic conditions. Um, the Bellinger momentum equation should be used if the uh, bed is horizontal or approximately horizontal. So the more steep the conditions are, the worse this equation gets at predicting the new downstream depth. But Remember, there's an upper limit to how steep the channel can get because if it's really steep, then there won't be a hydraulic jump. The channel flow would just stay supercritical and you wouldn't have a hydraulic jump. So this third assumption isn't a lot to worry about as well. Uh, and then the assumption that boundary shear stress is negligible. What that means is we're assuming that the two locations we're applying this equation to are pretty close together. So we're assuming that depth Y1 and Y2 are close enough together that we're not seeing a lot of uh, energy loss between them. Jeffrey Atkins asks, how, many, how small of a slope is allowable? I mean, just the steeper the slope, the bigger the error. So there isn't like an upper limit that we can say it's no longer allowed. It's just the closer you are to the assumptions being true, the more accurate the equation is. And so if it is horizontal, if the channel is horizontal, 
then you are honoring that assumption. But if it's not horizontal, I mean, the effect is minimal. Really, the, the assumptions that you have to be careful about is the uniform velocity distribution assumption is worrisome. And then this other one, boundary shear stress is negligible. That's the same as saying in pipe flow, you know, when we use the uh, Bernoulli's equation to predict how the pressure is changing through an expansion or a contraction in a pipe, we said, well, the pressure change is just because of the velocity change. It has nothing to do with energy loss. This is kind of the same thing. It's saying boundary shear stress is negligible. So that's essentially saying that there is no energy loss between point one and point two. So it's saying that the depth change only is because of the momentum being conserved through the conjugate depth. So keep that in mind. Uh, we do not yet have time to go through the example, but one last thing I'll mention before we part ways for today is that a lot of energy is lost in a hydraulic jump. And that's part of the beauty of them is that we can control where the jump occurs. We can make sure that that energy is expended uh, in an armored location that isn't going to experience scour. And sometimes they'll even put like big concrete blocks in a river downstream of a dam to kind of force the hydraulic jump and to absorb some of the turbulence and the momentum. And so, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a big field that the Army Corps has these physical models down in Mississippi to, uh, to understand uh, the amount of energy that's being exerted and trying to make sure that the hydraulic jump doesn't move around with varying flow rates. And so um, the amount of energy that's lost can be quantified as a function of the upstream versus the downstream depth. And so the units of this change of energy are going to be in terms of length. It's going to be length units and um, it would be the fraction of the energy that existed at location one, so delta E. In the example we'll work on Monday next week, we'll look at how much energy is lost through the hydraulic jump. So that's all the time we have for today. When we get together on Monday, we're gonna work this example, but let me just remind you that more immediately on the horizon in terms of what you should be working on over the weekend, is uh, putting the finishing touches on your project report and then homework 10 is on Blackboard now. And uh, if you have any questions about that, send me an email and uh, I'll continue grading the exams over the weekend. So you should see that pop up sometime soon. Hope you're all doing well. Enjoy your weekend. Don't get too crazy out there. Big weekend plans and all that. Take care. I'll see you on Monday.